Honorable Prime Minister, Silveria Jacobs, members of the Council of Ministers, officers of the NRPB, other invited guests of the press, good afternoon. The government of St. Martin, mindful of the rapid evolution of the digital space and desirous to improve internal operations and transactions with the general public, has embarked on a digital transformation project. It's been implemented under the NRPB and the Ministry of General Affairs. The project will seek to, one, strengthen the legislative and in institutional environment to facilitate technological implementations. Two, to build digital platforms to allow an increased number of transactions with government in a secure online environment. Three, modernize the public service centers to improve and increase the number of online transactions. And four, to implement an emergency response component which can be triggered in the event of a natural disaster. Activities implemented under this project will transform how citizens engage with the government. Emergencies such as the COVID-19 pandemic bring into clear focus the increased need for the ability of government to interact with its citizens online in a secure environment and allowing civil servants to work efficiently in office or remotely if the need arises. Public service centers will be retrofitted to provide services more efficiently. This will include the installation of kiosks to increase the number of transactions possible at these locations. An important part of the project will be establishing a digital identity for citizens. This will allow for accurate identification of citizens that will be conducting business with government. Part of this digital identification will be a single sign-on facility, which will allow citizens to securely log on to a government portal and access all services available to that citizen. No new ID numbers will be introduced under this project. Training for civil servants on the new digital tools is another important part of this project, and the target is to provide training to at least 80% of civil servants. A digital leadership team will be established to guide the project during and after project implementation. So I'm, I'm here to present the Emergency Income Support and Training Project, um, which uh, existed out of two major components. The first one was the training program, which was done together with the St. Martin Training Foundation. That unfortunately came to an end because the financing ended. Uh, all in all, a very successful component, even to the extent that the Council of Ministers decided uh, last year to extend the program uh, for another few months, uh, which, is, which is great because it had a true impact on people of St. Martin, their families, and by extent it will also benefit the quality of the hospitality sector. So thank you also for your uh, outspoken support for that particular component. The second component uh, is still ongoing. That is the one to where we are going to establish a so-called integrated social registry system. Now, after uh, the hurricanes passed in 2017, a major problem was that there was not really a map of areas that were uh, vulnerable where we could directly target people that are in vulnerable positions, help them out either financially, materially, etc., etc. Basically, there's a big blind spot when it comes to uh, which people, which communities might be in need of services from government, support after a hurricane, but also in case of COVID-19. Uh, we know that there are areas that are vulnerable, but there's no real data present. And data uh, is becoming more and more important to inform decision-making processes from the policy level all the way up to the, the Council of Ministers. Um, so the intention with this ISRS is that, first of all, we are looking at uh, how to develop the processes of what a so-called social registry unit would look like. How is the data that is there and that we're going to collect, how is that going to flow between the different departments and entities? Um, with that, also, when those processes are there, the software development is key. 
Uh, we have hired Computech in November last year to do the software element for us and they are currently working mostly together with the Ministry of VSA. Uh, all the departments there are involved because we're trying to look at all the different service deliveries uh, that is uh, financial assistance, legal assistance, medical assistance, etc. NRPB is doing is continuing the work that started with the Interim Recovery Bureau, which uh, committee, I'm sorry, which was to manage the program in its entirety. And today you will get a little taste of all of the different elements that you may not be specifically connected to, but in, in any way we are ex executing our task on behalf of the government, which means on behalf of the entire um, island. So. We're going to move on now to the next phase where you'll physically see some of the projects. But I just want to thank you for your time today and, and hope that this little presentation was worth um, the effort. Thanks, Giselle, and your team, and we'll move on to the next phase. Um, first of all, thank you very much. This is the first stop on a lot of stops this afternoon for you all. Take the mask off. Um, for you all, where it entails all of the projects for um, NRPB. You are standing on one of the three reconstruction projects of the Fast and Resilient Learning um, Project that this former Felixburg Jubilee Library, the next time you all visit for the official opening, will be transformed into a cultural heritage multi-purpose center that will encompass not only the library, but also include the museum, will also include CMARC, and other various elements of it to be able to create a um, multi-funding matrix organization that can be self-sufficient at some point in time. Um, so um, just a little backdrop on the project and where we are right now with the project. Um, as was stated earlier by my, my, my colleague um, Giselle, this is one of the three. The other project is in Miller Region, which is a system Marie Laurent school which is a designated school for special needs kids, especially within the Miller Region area. And um, after Hurricane Irma, a lot of the students had to be transported to different schools, um, St. Dominic and so forth and so on. We will totally reconstruct that whole school to create a better facility for kids with special needs, a better after school program, um, areas in that school that you have a de-stress area, you have um, areas that can deal with kids on different levels and also make it accessible for the students who may have disabilities as well. Um, that is the second project. The third project is a Charles Leopold Bell in Kobe. It is a two-phase project. It is a reconstruction project and also a restoration project. As you all know, the building in front is deemed a monumental um, feeling for the persons in the community of um, Cold Bay, even though it's not on a monument list as yet. But we are going to do a restoration part of that area um, for that school and also create that school, which is a behavioral issue school of students who have um, um, behavioral problems that can stem from many things, issues at home, uh, abuse, and, and, and the like. And so that school will be transformed into a school that would be able to give those students the, the, the much needed attention that is, that is necessary to help them to transition back also. And in addition to that, the project will also train and retrain teachers in understanding and looking at some of those key signs and key um, 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 issues, indicators that can be addressed prior and also make sure that it's a smooth transition as well. The fourth project that is on um, the FRLP is the MMIS, which is the Ministry Management Information System. As you all just had a, a, a presentation with a digital um, component of the project, this will also link with that digital component by creating a streamless database that will link all the schools. Right now, most of the schools use an Excel-based system to gather information for the students. This will be not an Excel, it will be a full-fledged database software that is set up in all of the schools that will link student behaviors, student performances, indicators and the like that will trigger certain type of reactions for the staff and the teachers in remedying certain problems. One of the things that we have seen um, for some time now is that at times we wait until 
it is too late in order to fix the problem. Um, but we are, with this new system now, it will assist the Ministry of uh, Education linking all of the classrooms, as I said, and also the, um, the school boards. And within the Ministry of Mekis, it will also link um, with the Ministry of VSA and also with uh, the Ministry of Justice that deals with the Court of Guardianship and all the issues and the problems. So we can finally be able to deal with the problem single-handedly and have that information flow without and through. Um, as you know, or should I mention, this project is a $30 million project. Um, and that $30 million project, right now, I am happy to say that the first phase of that project, which is a project preparation grant, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Prime Minister, has been signed off on, um, I believe it was last month, um, last month, which gave us the, the opportunity now to start preparing the project at a particular level. And what does that mean? It means now that we now have team members that are coming on board that we can pay out of the project that will deal single-handedly with the, the library and also create a policy, a framework that deals with needs assessment, special needs and behavioral issues within the schools. Um, so yes, I, you may have seen in the, in the handouts that you were given that there was a general story about ERP-1 and there's also a separate page about the school repairs. Um, we are doing three schools at the moment as the first, uh, the first batch of repairs out of 19. So one of these three is Sister Regina School where we are now, where um, the contractor is going to change the roof sheets, uh, interior uh, ceilings, uh, there's going to be placed new shutters to make the building uh, hurricane resilient. So these work started uh, on the 1st of March. They are on track. Um, the contractor was saying that very soon they're going to replace all the roof sheets and we are hoping to finish all these works uh, before, mid, before mid-May. Um, also worth mentioning is that, of course, um, we do not want to interrupt the, the, the normal uh, school uh, um, practices, so we have also uh, assisted the school in, uh, in relocating uh, some of the students. Uh, one of the buildings is still in use, so the, the, the way the contractor is working is that they work on part of the school uh, while they do not touch the other side. Uh, once this is finished, the students can move to this side and they can work on the other side. And also part of this, the, the, the classes have been removed, have been uh, relocated to the uh, Simpson Bay Community Center next door. Uh, we will also visit that where you can see uh, how that relocation was organized. Uh, by the way, that's also a shelter location that we have relocated. So that's another reason why we will uh, we'll visit that. Mrs. Prime Minister, whole committee, whole council, everyone here, welcome on the DECOM yard. The removal of the wrecks from Simpson Bay is one of the many projects that is uh, initiated by NRPB. We have been working on this project for a little over a month now. What you see here behind you is just a part of it. The project in general outlined three phases. We have the offshore recovery of the wrecks. We have the shore cleanup on all the shorelines of the lagoon. And then finally, all the debris and all the wrecks are being brought here. And here they are recycled. The waste is segregated. And what you can see from there, it's stuffed in the various containers. And then all the waste is going to be shipped out of the island. We don't know the exact location yet, but probably it's going to be going to the Netherlands for incineration at one of the, uh, the big incinerators in Rotterdam or in Amsterdam. So that's the plan for the time being. We put them in the containers, we put the seal on it, and then they're safe for St. Martin out of the way. Uh, we are here working with a Dutch contractor named Kole. Kole got 30 people on site. Out of these 30 people, they got 12 Dutch guys flown in, and the rest is local uh, residents of St. Martin. And Cola also had put a huge effort in getting as much as local manpower engaged in this project as well. With the help of Mr. Paul Ellinger there, of the Ministry of Transport, 
we have recruited a number of uh, qualified persons, which for us from the Netherlands is very difficult to find, but with the knowledge of uh, Mr. Paul, uh, we were very pleased uh, to have a, a good team. Then ourselves, we are the supervisory team on behalf of the NRPB. I work for EOS together with my companion in the corner there, Mario, and Smitty, who on the island doesn't know Smitty. I see all the cars with all the girls waving at him. Hi, Smitty. And then we have Mr. Singh. And they have two companions, Mr. Jaro and Mr. Omar, and they're doing uh, a shift from seven o'clock in the morning till one, and then from one o'clock till seven. So they share the day with two and two persons on behalf of NRPB monitoring the operation here. What they're looking at is safeguarding environment, safeguarding um, um, uh, safety, of course. Uh, it's a dangerous operation and, uh, and they're also watching that the segregation of waste is going in the right container and that the right container with the right label and the light, right seal on it is going to go off to a storage facility where all the boxes are being accumulated and from there it's going to be shipped overseas. I'm very pleased to have you here uh, this afternoon here at the terminal. I think it has been a, a, a long journey to get uh, here at this uh, stage, but I'm very pleased to see that we made a significant milestone uh, here in the airport by uh, basically uh, demolishing and cleaning up the airport to such a state that I almost need to ask to put off your shoes. Uh, because it's getting clean here at the uh, uh, airport. So I said, uh, basically, it looks so tidy, you almost could put a few desks here and start uh, op operating. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd, I'd be careful with this, this message. Yeah, so, but I'm very pleased basically to see that uh, we made uh, a major step forward to bring it uh, word here as at the moment. So the agenda for this afternoon is that uh, Mr. Mirto Bril, the project uh, manager, will give an, uh, a short presentation on the status and the progress on the, uh, on the airport. And then we take you through a short tour through the airport to see basically that everything has been uh, tidied up and we're really ready to go for the next uh, phase. As you all know that we are in the middle of the tender evaluation and uh, in, the, uh, in the coming uh, uh, two months uh, the results will be uh, uh, announced uh, from, uh, from that. So the team is working hard on the evaluation. So I give the word to uh, Mr. Mirto Bril to do the uh, presentation and uh, I wish you all already an, uh, a good afternoon. Uh, this is some pictures that you can see of what the airport looked like before, but we'd like to just jump into the presentation at this point. The reason we're doing these tours, we've been doing this with a lot of our stakeholders, is to bring them up to speed with what's going on at the airport. A lot of concerns out there that there's not enough activity at the airport, so we're taking the opportunity to do this public outreach to all the stakeholders, not just the airline, as the airport workers, but also the community of St. Martin for the, us to be able to bring them up to speed with what's going on. Where we are right now is before we started the reconstruction, we had some pre-works. Pre-works was the sprinkler system, where we're standing right now, was not operational. Not, none of the areas that was non-operational, the sprinkler system was functioning. We had to put that back into operation before the construction started. Only the areas where we were functioning from, which is the package one, the sprinkler system was functioning. So that has been completed in April. The mold remediation, as you can see, where we're standing right now, is very, very clean. Upstairs has been cleaned, as well as the upper floors where the airport offices were located. That has also been cleaned. The basement has also been cleaned. So we'll be doing a walkthrough where you can be able to see all of the material that we removed from the, the project and how um, the mold is now no longer in the, the terminal. We have been able to remove the mold to a capacity where it's 
acceptable. The balloons and everything we use on a daily basis provided by the National Weather Service. What we do is that we basically um, just provide a service. Initially, it's cheaper now, but every time we do a flight, um, that would be about $500. And we do two a day. So all that is, is it's less now, it's cheaper now, but that is funded by the US because like in meteorology, everybody needs data. Okay, so it's important for them to get the data also. Uh, we, we, this, this balloon is filled with hydrogen. This here is what we call a hydrogen generator. So I guess most people would understand hydrogen is, um, water is H2O. All right, H2O. So water comes in here for, for a filtration system and this piece of equipment there, it separates the H and the O. So all the hydrogen from here goes into this tank, and that's what we use because of the density so that the balloon can be released. Um, do you have a, a, the sensor? Um, we attach a sensor to the bottom of the balloon, tie with a long string, and that sensor, as it goes up, it sends back information to antenna on the roof that goes into the office and is processed and they get it all over the world. So as it goes up, it gives us wind direction and speed, temperature, humidity, etc. This balloon on good days can go up to about 40,000 feet and would cover all the flight levels. When it gets to a certain height, it would burst and then that would be it. So you cannot recover it or anything like that. It also has a GPS on it so we can monitor exactly where it is. So sometimes it could go down as far down as Trinidad, over Trinidad and so on. Yeah, they move. You, if, you, if you use flight radar and you're tracking flights, sometimes you could see the balloons also. They show you the balloon movement. When this is full, has enough, she would just tie it, tie the sensor to it with a long string, and off it goes. If you notice, we have a small weather station out there also. And that will assist them with the wind direction. Similar to our radar, we're in a gap. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we're in a gap. And the, the countries next to us, which would be um, doing that, would be Guadeloupe and um, Puerto Rico. The technology has changed significantly um, in terms of the way everything is processed. But the concept remains the same. So what she's doing is she's just going to tie up the balloon, and as I said, it's, it's hydrogen, so it will go up quickly. And it is, it is, that sort of data is also very important for the aviation sector. Um, now there are other, other, project, other activities that we are planning with uh, the meteorological department. Uh, one is the design of a new office for the, for the department, which is supposed to be here. Um, the project is, is uh, assisting in the design of that, uh, that office for the med department as well as for the civil aviation uh, department. Um, other things is equipment for, uh, for the department, minor equipment, smaller water sta weather stations. We, we also have the intention to support automatic weather stations and the only thing we are waiting for is to get clarity on the locations where uh, these stations can be located.